Well, I got to say thanks so much for tuning in today for another episode of Let's Be Blunt. And I am so psyched because I'm bringing you Let's Be Blunt, like I said I was going to do from the beginning, from around the country. And I happen to be sitting in the epicenter of marijuana, really, on the left coast, folks. I'm talking about California, coming to you outside of Los Angeles, outside of L.A., and had an opportunity to this week, because I was out here for some of the other business, to literally sit down and do several podcasts. And I'm psyched because today... We're going to have a chance to talk to a person who's a founder and CEO of something called The Herbal Chef, a catering company focused on cannabis-infused fine dining. His company offers gourmet edibles from frozen, frozen CBD to THC-infused dinners, as well as catered and private dinners. As He's been named the number one cannabis infusion chef, not in California, folks, in the entire world. Come on with your bad self. You know, my guest today is Mr. Chris Sage. And I'm telling you, I can't say thank you enough, sir, for being here and being a part of Let's Be Blunt with Montal. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I think what I want to do now, I just gave you that, that big you know, intro. Oh, it's wonderful. And, you know, people think, Chef, hmm, this must be a guy that's been, you know, started working when he was a kid at McDonald's and he went to Burger King and then he went, but, but no, no, no. You were in school studying to be a doctor, an MD, correct? Yeah, that's true. That's over the top, my friend. And you went all the way through. Did you go all the way through med school or did you get uh, out of No, early? no. So I had this epiphany before uh, I was going to roll into that and realize what my path was in life and how I wanted to help people with preventative health rather than put a Band-Aid on afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that, that epiphany happened while you were studying molecular cellular biology, correct? Yeah, correct. At the University of California, Santa Cruz. Holy moly, my friend. So you were sitting there in class. You know, reading your molecular biology books and went, hmm, there's got to be a better way. Yeah, and I'm going through organic chemistry and I'm going through all these different classes and I'm, um, you know, we're choosing to do different subject topics. And mm, the way that my brain works is, okay, if I'm going to do something, I want to know about it. And I'm a big believer in responsible use of psychedelics for spiritual growth. And uh, I didn't realize that until I started to dabble with cannabis. And mm -hmm. um, at first, I use it to help me regulate my schedule. For years, I was on Concerta, which is a uh, amphetamine that um, it's like, you know, Adderall or mm -hmm. uh, any one of them. And uh, because I have ADHD and mm -hmm. when I was taking this, it would, in the morning, I would take it, and then I wouldn't be hungry the entire day, mm -hmm. and I would be laser-focused the entire day, but I would, no eating, and at night, I would still be buzzing from that, and yes. I wouldn't get to bed until late, and then in the morning, I'd have to wake up again and t take it, and the days that I didn't take it, it was like... It, basically count that right that day off right, like i right. couldn't accomplish anything. scattered yeah right. exactly couldn't focus and i didn't like that i didn't like having to need something in order to do anything with my life and mm -hmm. i didn't like that sense of oh if i didn't take this my life is totally out of control and uh so i used cannabis to actually help me just regulate my schedule meaning that i would eat a little bit in the morning i would take my medicine and then i would uh i would you know, during lunchtime, I would smoke a little bit, I would eat uh, my lunch, and then I would go back to class, finish whatever I had to do. And then at night, when I was done with my studies uh, and, and dinner and everything, or then I would uh, use it to help me fall asleep at a gotcha. decent hour. And so- And using different types of cannabis throughout the day, right? Yeah, right. mostly it was a sativa <laughs> mm -hmm. um, during the day that had some, was heavy in uh, lemonine and pinene. Got it. Uh, and then, you know, and back then too, you're getting it from your dealer. So it sure. wasn't uh, it wasn't something where it was like, we had all these profiles, but we'd know um, now looking back, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, the idea was, I just wanted to know what I was putting in my body. I was like, okay, if I'm going to use this every day, I need to know what's happening. And so I started to study it in all of my classes. I started to make it the focal point of my dissertation and all of my papers. And mm -hmm. um, so I, I just gained this wealth of knowledge. And back then there was, you know, I found 10 papers in our right. ginormous scientific library. Right. And we had one of the, we have one of the biggest scientific libraries in the U.S. at UC Santa Cruz. And there was 10 papers on it in 2010. That's crazy. It's, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. I mean, that's part of the reason why I'm doing Let's Be Blunt is because I think it is absolutely imperative. This industry is taken off and, and with, with gangbusters, but people stop thinking that people need to be educated. Yeah. And even the consumer who goes into a dispensary, 
doesn't take the time to read about what it is they're going to go in and try to buy. They're going to rely on what somebody else tells them. I, I you know, I, I, uh, I got diagnosed with MS, and the first thing I did was try to fee- see if I could find every published, peer-reviewed document on MS that was written back at the time I got diagnosed. Because I thought, you know, I, I, it's not that I want to try to be smarter than the doctor, but I should have as much knowledge as the person who's getting ready to tell me what to do to my body yeah. and be able to question it and be able to think about it, whether or not what they're suggesting to me is right. So the same process that I applied to to my diagnosis with MS is the same process I, I, I you know, applied to cannabis. And this has now been a 20-year journey where I try my best now continuously to find whatever is the most recent peer-reviewed you know, document that's been published, read that, and then I also look into some of the other science that's out there that's not necessarily peer reviewed, but just, you know, anecdotal stories and things like that to see if, they, you know, maybe something rings true and I want to share it with other people. Yeah, and you really can't discount the anecdotal evidence and right. how many people are coming forward with their stories because Correct. ultimately um, it's just a matter of there hasn't been clinical trials and Correct. there hasn't been these studies. And it doesn't mean that it's all you know not true when somebody with Parkinson's comes in and they smoke cannabis and they go from shaking wildly to a calm state. Correct. And it, it's, it's, you can't deny these type of things. And you look at cases like with Canna Kids and, and Sophie Ryan and, mm-hmm. and her mom and dad, um, Tracy and Josh, and what they're doing on how they're applying this cannabis medicine to along with modern medicine. Yes. Um, it's fantastic. And it's, it's really mind blowing. And when you look at stories like Sophie's, you cannot help, but then understand the true nature of this plant and why it's right. here. And that's kind of what I, what I found out through my studies. It was, it's a female conscious plant that is, you know, wildly useful across many mediums. Not if we were to just look at the medicinal component alone, it is a, complete negligence why the U.S. government would ever make this illegal. When you were in, in med school, you probably couldn't find anything back then, what, 10 years ago, that was talked about the endocannabinoid system? There was literally, like I said, there was very few papers, mm-hmm. and there was, uh, it was almost non-existent, and it was all... Uh, Negative. It, 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 <laughs> no, it actually wasn't. It was, it was all, all the all the stuff that I found was actually positive towards a uh, more a more positive correlation towards healing with with the endocannabinoid mm-hmm. system, and so that's what prompted me. Like, okay, well, why is this illegal then? And then I started to go into history and right. political uh, political studies, uh, which is what then led me to understand that this was all bullshit political uh, agenda from the early the late eighteen hundreds. To the early 1900s where cannabis was essentially used as a scapegoat and but, and also even by the guy you know i mean a lot of people don't don't know this and i bring it up in a lot of my podcasts to make sure people understand it let me just go back and look at the history of of anslinger you know who's the guy who literally actually vilified cannabis yep. to the world but what people don't understand is if you look at anslinger before he got on his tirade he was a prohibitionist he was really helped to be responsible for keeping prohibition in place during Prohibition, he was an advocate for cannabis because he, he st- made statements that cannabis at least wasn't as violent a drug right. and thought that it was a good substitution for alcohol. Then all of a sudden, they yanked the rug out from underneath him and legalized alcohol. He was like, dang, I got to have something <laughs> that I gotta work on. Yep. So he called his boys, you know, William Randolph Hearst and, and Charles mm-hmm. DuPont. Who had other agendas, you yeah. know, textiles and paper. You know, and I think the Rockefellers and the Carnegies had Correct. something to do with that, that now had the steel mills yep. who were using, you know, crude fuel where hemp was being used as a biofuel. So Correct. it was a cash, it was a rival cash crop to tobacco, to the steel industries. And so guess who's stuffing also, his pockets with money saying that, hey, we need this done because we're going to lose out on X amount of money. Take a look at, our, you know, pre pre you know, 1937, majority of clothing, everything from, you know, people don't get it, the word canvas, which was on top of those wagons that went west, comes from cannabis. So people need to understand huh. that the majority, that. yeah, so all the sails that were used in the entire U.S. Navy and most of the navies worldwide no were made from hemp. Oh, that's incredible. All of the rope on ships made yeah. from hemp. Even after cannabis was made, and hemp was made illegal in 1937, 
in 1941-42, the U.S. government forced farmers to regrow hemp yeah. so that they could restock ships with rope. That's so incredible. it's not like, you know, this is something that, that they added was, was done because we were afraid of a drug. We used the drug moniker as an enslavement tool. Absolutely. You know, made sure that, you know, you take a look from 1937 on, 80% of the people who have been persecuted and put in jail for cannabis are people of color. Absolutely. And it was done so because we didn't have a real good way to enslave people, so we may as well enslave them by putting them in a prison. Yep. I mean, that's when Reefer Madness came out. Correct. That's when they were using and, and the Mexican all of the bad people in, in Reefer Madness were people of color. Yeah, exactly. And it was, I mean, it's just, when you look back on it, it's, it's comical how ridiculous it all was but and, we bought it, it yeah which is but we bought it and it, it, and, and it brings you to today because you know i mean I, I i talk about the politics of the day quite often and i think you know i think we want to ignore the fact that you know the person who seems to be getting most of the, the retribution and the angst who is in the leadership position is no nothing more than a symptom of the rest of society who has been looking for some broad excuse to hate. Yeah. And so they have a reason now. They got a leader who hates, and so if he can hate, then so can I. Yeah. And that's when you look at cannabis and you think, how can people who claim to be so worried about their health care and so worried about affording health care want to ignore something that is so affordable when it comes to health care? Big pharma. Oh, no question. No <laughs> it's question. just so obvious that um, there is a business that is created and generated through illness. Yes. And so when people are ill, they make money. When people are sick or when people are not, then they can't. Correct. And so that is, I think, the biggest roadblock that we're going to have to fake as I mean, face esoterically uh, and physically, like as as we go through Ex the you yeah. Know, no, the next stages of cannabis. And what, what you're doing is literally providing people a simple way to understand, help to get, understand but yeah. also help to get their bodies into a homeostasis, homeostatic situation where yeah. they are more or less susceptible to illness through infusion of cannabis. You know, you got to say, and that's another one. You just stop and think. We look back to pre, you know, the Industrial Revolution, and we think it's the Industrial Revolution that's caused all of the new and varied types of illnesses we have. But the Industrial Revolution coincided with the prohibition of cannabis, the fact that families that, you know, when 90% of the people on the planet are eating a porridge of hemp almost every day, getting cannabinoids in, into their system and charging their endocannabinoid system, helping that to ward off illness, then all of a sudden you stop. Boom, completely. Now we've got generations that have not consumed cannabis, the endocannabinoid system is sitting there begging for something to help stimulate it and not getting it. So therefore, opens us up to, I think, other sicknesses that we really would have probably never seen at the level that we see now had we continued to consume hemp. We can go on this Absolutely. one for, for days. Yeah, I, I have, yeah exactly. Yeah, right? I mean, we could go down that rabbit hole for sure. But Absolutely. How population, uh, you know, in, in different ways in which and not only cannabis, but just things were taken away to that were serving the self and help uh, in self healing. Absolutely, and you know, so I mean, I really applaud you. So you know, you, you're in medical school, you decide to study, and then what made you say, hey, dude, "That's a stretch"? I mean, I'm, I'm I'm talking to the guy who wants to be a doctor, and you say, "Nah, I think I'm gonna go mess with a couple frying pans." You know <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially coming from a, a traditional Middle Eastern background, my mm -hmm. family. Uh, has certain expectations and it's you you go and be a doctor you go and be a lawyer mm -hmm. you're an engineer it's about it right. and if you're not one of those it's like oh you know it's you're the black sheep and <laughs> so when i went off and and did this i not i mean you know everyone was just beyond themselves and they didn't know how to react my mom my poor mother calling me crying every day like please don't leave please don't do it and i had an epiphany mm -hmm. um after a an experience with psilocybin that mm -hmm. blew my mind and that opened me up to understanding that ultimately life you, uh, you have to make every decision in life and if you are not making those from your heart then you're not going to be fulfilled 
Right. And so if I was going to always listen to my parents, then I wouldn't truly be happy with my life and, and what I wanted to accomplish and do. And so it was this abrupt realization that I just needed to take control of my decision making and, and everything that was going to happen in my life. I was going to accept my losses and I was going to celebrate my wins. Mm. And, um, and then from that moment, I realized that I wanted to be in, I wanted to be in food. I wanted to be in the food and beverage industry and I wanted to help people heal through what they're putting into their body. Cause that's the first defense that sure. you, you give your body. And, uh, with that realization, I, I just, I went about it. I was going to go to culinary school. I was going to do all this stuff. And then I had an interview at a uh, two Michelin star restaurant and, uh, the chef basically said, um, he brought out his entire staff and he was like, cause I was telling him I'm going to go to culinary school and I'm going to go do this. And, and then he was like, how many, he brought out probably 20 kitchen staff, maybe 15. And he's like, how many of you went to culinary school? Everybody raises their hand. How many of you finished culinary school? Two people are, leave their hand up <laughs> and he's like, don't even fucking waste your money. Don't go waste your time and your money. Like come in, see if you even like working in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I came in uh, the day after and I came in every single day after that. And uh, I didn't even get paid for a while. I was just, I was like, this is what I know I need to do. Wow. And, uh, and I, I did it. And my parents at that time were just done with me they were like we don't want to talk to you we don't want you to talk to your brother we don't want you in the house like i was living out of my car i was doing what i had to do because i had this vision and i had to i had to do it i just knew that this was the path set out for me and uh it was very difficult but also i was very excited and i just <laughs> knew that you know I didn't know what was going to come of anything. And I didn't even know that I was going to use cannabis at that point. All I knew is that I was an advocate for it. And uh, I didn't know I was going to use it in my professional life. And then a few, you know, a year goes by, two years goes by. And, and you've now, now made it through the OJT training as yeah. a chef, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I, I got my, you know, I got my chops and I really, you know, excelled in, in this area. And I was able to apply my science background with my culinary background and create something in the middle that is sophisticated, but approachable and is educational, but entertaining. And now, you know, and I also wanted to create something that I could bring to my parents and my grandparents mm -hmm. who now have completely changed their mind on the entire subject through education. Right. And, uh, both, both the subject of being a cook or chef and also the subject of cannabis. Exactly. Got it. Um, because you know, for them, a, a cook, a chef is a, a very low level position. Mm -hmm. um, but as we've seen in America throughout the past, you know, 40 years, uh, is the upbringing of the, the rising of the chef and how important, uh, our farmers are, how important our chefs are, how important the people that bring us food are, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just changed completely, but I wanted to bring something that I could apply and bring to my grandparents who were very traditional old school. So if I can change my grandparents' mind right. about all this, then I was going to be able to change everybody else's. And so that's how and and what I thought about is food is perennial. Food con it touches everybody in the world. It doesn't matter what you and I agree on, it, whether we agree on religion or not. It doesn't matter whether you and I are the same race, whether we speak the same language, whether we have the same sexual preference. It doesn't matter. You and I, when we sit down and we break bread with one another, we create a bond. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is the most important part about uh, this entire process of education. And when, when, so when did you decide to start infusing your food products with cannabis? Uh, well, 2010, I was thinking about it cause I was just getting brownies and rice krispies and I was just really over that whole, sure. you know, just eating sugar mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then, so 2010, I was experimenting, 2011, I was experimenting, 2012, I was experimenting. And then I basically experimented up until 2014, where I started to crack the code of, pardon me, mm -hmm. there's a difference right now. And there's a differentiation. And this is something we were just chatting about before we got on, but there's a dif uh, differentiation in the education where people there's infusion and then there's dosing right many people can infuse because that doesn't take much technical skill it takes it takes a little bit you need to know how what temperatures to heat it up to and sure. it's fat soluble etc but ultimately you have this this thing that you create and you don't know 
what the dosing is on it. You don't know how powerful, how weak, et cetera. Right. Dosing is a bit of chemistry and it's a bit of math that you need to do in order to create a regulated market. And mm -hmm. that is the differentiating factor. Anybody can infuse weed and get somebody messed up. Sure. Not everybody can dose this and create a business model and create something that is replicable. And that's kind of the difference between a cook and a chef. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And any 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 cook can can throw a little cannabis in anything that they want to throw cannabis in. Yeah. A chef understands what makes it work. I think. Yeah, I think that there's that even even accomplished chefs uh, still don't quite understand the cannabis part. They right. they get the that they can get people high with it, right. but they don't understand that dosing, like the, how important that that is. Because if you tell somebody, hey, you're going to get 10 milligrams, and you accidentally give them 30, 20 milligrams, right, or even 30, 40, right, yeah. right, yeah. I mean, you're going to ruin their entire day. <laughs> the kidding. next time that they talk about cannabis, they're going to talk about that one time that they got paranoid under the one under the table and didn't never want to come out. And, right. you know, we hear all sorts of stories all the time. Right. And, you know, I guess it, 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 it I, I've had discussions with, you know, some chefs before talking about the fact that, you know, and, and I think, you know, again, part of the problem in the industry, you know, we jumped aboard the bandwagon without slowing down for a second and ensuring what we were jumping aboard was real good, solid information. Now, there's a lot of these shows that popped up, you know, a couple of years ago, cooking shows, show people going in the kitchen, taking, you know, a certain amount of oil or something else, putting in a product, heating it up to 350, 400 degrees, not knowing that they just destroyed the entire terpene profile yep. of the cannabis that they were cooking. And if the THC sustained itself, part of the reason why they had to add more was because they burned it off. Yep. And then, so they added more as the product was cooling down and didn't realize that as it cooled down, it was going to get stronger. Yep. So that's right. That's where you get those, you know, those bursts of 50 milligram hits from uh, one bite and the three milligrams from another bite. Exactly. The non-homogenization of it all. Yeah. So that's why we created a curriculum that is now going to be implemented in culinary schools mm -hmm. where chefs who want to do this professionally mm -hmm. can get this certification so that they understand the science behind it all. Because ultimately... Once you understand that, you can and, – and part of it, too, is understanding cannabis hospitality. You are now – like the way that I view this and what we're doing with the restaurant is we're going to view this as cannabis hospitality, which is very different than a what's traditionally in the marketplace where – you have people coming to get alcoholic beverages, mm -hmm. they get inebriated, and then they care less about the heat, like whatever is happening in front of them. They, right. they are more in a social engagement and therefore care less about it. They're inebriated. Things slide and slip. I mean, I do it all the time, and I love right. it. And don't get me wrong, there's a time and place for everything. Right. But ultimately, when you have a new establishment where people are getting high— and there is this consciousness shift, which is what getting high is, and or perception shift. Then you need to treat your guests with the you know level of hospitality in which they're now perceiving. So mm -hmm. when they're sitting in your in your establishment and they're getting a little bit elevated as the meal goes on, then what we do is offer up a multitude of other experiences that that help bring out the sensitivity of cannabis because cannabis uh, heightens all your senses. So if yes. you're, and if, and it heightens whatever emotions you're feeling. So if you're feeling happy, it's going to make that, you know, even uh, more, more so. intense. That's yeah. right. And so that's what, or if you think you like what you just took a bite of, it's going to be more intense. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so what we're doing is playing around with that. And we're really trying to make it so that, uh, you know, cannabis hospitality has its own set of understanding so that people can create something that is really special and that people want to be involved in as they're uh, consuming cannabis. Well, you know, I, I visited a couple of, I visited one, you know, I guess West Hollywood is the first municipality in the country that offered eight licenses yep. for restaurants that allow you to consume cannabis in the restaurant not infused in the food yet, right. but in the restaurant along with your meal. And, you know, even though you're not eating, but you, in some cases you can eat, but if you're not eating the food that's being made in the restaurant, you're right. eating third-party food or things that have been brought right. in that you can purchase, that experience is still one that you really have to pay very, very close attention. And each person, I guess, you know, each waiter has to really be – a little bit more educated about, you know, people's, you know, uh, body type, body size, you know, I mean, weight. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And that's why we have guide training. So mm -hmm. in, in our restaurant, we don't have servers. We have guides and they're mm -hmm. guiding you along this journey. Mm -hmm. And so the guides are responsible for sort of being your, you know, your helping hand and mm -hmm. have, helping you understand, you know, what it is. If you've never tried cannabis before, if you want to try Take cannabis. Take your time. <laughs> yeah, it's like a lover. You don't just right. jump into it. You, you know, you learn each other and you, th this is a relationship that you're building with this plant. And that's it, in the same way that, you know, you don't, do shots of 151 the first time you drink. Right. Like, it's just not a good idea. No. Nope. <laughs> and you don't do 10 of them. No. <laughs> right. Well, this this is really kind of leads me into the question, but that's just, this is what you're doing with the Herbal Chef. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So the Herbal Chef is, you know, we, we do a lot of public events. So we do like Sundance. We do South by Southwest. We do uh, all sorts of festivals, et cetera. And then we do a lot of private dining with our chefs around L.A. and, and beyond. And then we also do, uh, we have education as part of that. So I fly all around the world speaking at these culinary expos. So I'm a liaison uh, between the real culinary industry and the uh, cannabis industry. Mm -hmm. So right now I work with the American Culinary Federation and I work with the National Russian Association to make sure that what we are bringing uh, to the industry is solid and sound information about what's going on here and about the science of cooking with cannabis mm -hmm. versus like anybody can do this. And, you know, a lot of it consists of how uh, these companies are going to be affected. The food and beverage industry in general is going to be affected by cannabis consumption. Well, no question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's happening. So the education portion also includes like, you know, our, Herbal Chef certification and what we're doing in the schools. Uh, and then we have manufacturing. We have three products that are coming out. Uh, we're two products that are coming out this year, and then a couple products that are coming out at the beginning of next year. Uh, and they're all, two of them are CBD based, one's THC, three are CBD based, one's THC. And then uh, we have the fifth pillar, which is entertainment. Uh, and that is represented by William Morris Endeavor, have a lot of our own content created, uh, which is one of the things that I'll share with you. Um, and we have, you know, many shows that I've done, we've mm -hmm. created from fun shows to more lifestyle and uh, travel. Um, so we, we create a lot of our own content through what we're doing. And then obviously now is going to be uh, the brick and mortar restaurant. Now, you know, when it, when it comes to, and it, you know, that's one of the things I've been talking to a lot of people about, and especially most recently, because, you know, we, in this industry is in the last, you know, four years, jumped on the CBD bandwagon, but we all know for a fact that that plant has, and, you know, if you listen to scientists in Canada, over 160 cannabinoids. If you listen to people in Europe right now, they're saying it could be closer to 250 cannabinoids. And, you know, that's variants on the cannabinoids. Those are acids of the cannabinoids. So you're looking at, you know, CB. D, CBG, v, CBN, CBG, CBN, yeah, all, the, all these other 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 cannabinoids that actually work in an entourage effect, absolutely, and are and necessary, with THC. and with THC yeah. and even THCA, yeah. you know, where you know if you don't heat it and you can keep it in a, in a non heated form, THCA basically can act as an accelerant to ensure yeah. that you know the the other cannabinoids actually permeate the, you know, mitochondria and permeate yep. the cell wall. So you, you get better enhancement of a CBD response if Absolutely. you have some THCA in there. If you you some... Wait, so Montel, you're telling me that using the entirety of the plant is better than just isolating one specific <laughs> component? Go figure. Yeah, go Never figure. Never would have thought. Uh, yeah, 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 come on. I, I, but, you know, but, but unfortunately what happened is, you know, we have such a short and small attention span that, you know, we did one special air. Thank you, Internet. You know, ah, boy, thank you, Internet. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Cable. You know, yeah. so so one special airs and somebody says CBD and everybody jumps up and down and says CBD, CBD, CBD. It's not the end of all. Yep. You know, I, I, that CBD would work about 10 times better if there was some CBG there. Yeah, absolutely. And depending on what the malady is, maybe we increase the level of CBG. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at the plant, when the plant, you know, most people don't know that's that CBD and THC comes from CBG. Yeah. So when the plant is first growing <laughs> for the first six weeks of the, of the plant's growth, the majority of the, the prominent cannabinoid is CBG. And then CBG turns into THCA, THC, THCV. So you get all these chemicals that kind of start to, to, I don't know, amalgamate or turn into other things. Yeah. And we now, 
once the plant is grown, and you go back and look at it, the level of CBG is down under about 0.002%. Right. And but, pretty much all strains. Right. So why not go back to the first six weeks when CBG is prominent, just like other stem cells? Yeah. Think about that. So if you kind of liken CBG to the stem cell that turns into other things, right. why not go back to that first six weeks of growth and extract extra CBG right then and then infuse that back in again later, increasing the level of CBG, which might actually impact the veracity or the, you know, the potency of the THC. And the bioavailability Correct. or the way that it, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of that with genetics yes. and how all of genetics has been transforming and what mm -hmm. it's turning into. Mm -hmm. I think that people are starting to understand that there's a very big need for CBN, CBGs. And all of that is turning into, okay, well, how can we breed it to Correct. where we can harvest these plants and get more of a CBG profile, CBN profile. Right. And so I think that we're going to start to see a lot of that uh, micro cultivation come about. Yeah, that micro cultivation, it's, it's, it's simpler. It's much more simple than, you know, if you take a look at what, you know, the U.S. did from no, the you know late 50s, early 60s, and most of the 60s, you know, here, most of the farmers and growers of cannabis here in the United States tried to grow CBG, CBD out of the plant. Yep. They tried to force the plant to grow more and more THC. If they had left the plant alone, oh, man, going back to what the plant originally was, I remember, I, you know, I will say it straight up, I can remember getting high when I was in high school back in, you know, 1973, 70, 72, 73, yeah. and thinking, I don't ever remember being that high. Yeah. Even now, you can give me something that's got, you know, 25% THC. I don't ever remember being as high as I was in 1973 with something that was probably 12 or 13% THC. So, hmm. hmm, what's that all Spread about? Spread out all of it. Well, you know, <laughs> THC or CBD counteracts the psychoactivity of THC. Yes. So, right. and, and what I find really interesting, I, I do a lot of plant studies and I work with um, different ethnobotanists and uh, mycologist researchers from around the world, especially when we go do these dinners mm -hmm. everywhere. We'll go and uh you know forage for local plants etc and use the plants in the dinner mm -hmm. um and one thing that i've found out through all this is that naturally plants have if they can give you something that may turn into un, uh something unpleasant or if they can uh create a psychoactivity or if they can create if they create for instance a devil's club right mm -hmm. uh if you are walking and you there's a spiky stick and if it hits your skin, you're going to break out into a massive rash. Mm -hmm. The only way to get rid of that rash is to take the devil's club, scrape off the uh, the needles, and then get to the root bark, macerate it, and then apply it on the rash. And that's how it heals. If so, every, well, come on. I mean, you know, this is, this is basic physics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite yeah, reaction. Yeah, and in what's beautiful about plants is that it contains it within the own plant. So mm -hmm. in the same way that cannabis has THC, it also has CBD to balance everything out. Right. And I think that's a really important marker that people oftentimes miss because they're just looking for the high and they don't understand that it's, you know, that the potency is not everything. Right. Right. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I oftentimes, and I question people who tell me, oh, well, you know, I had a little bit of whatever, bubble, 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 whatever, <laughs> you know, they do whatever the name is. And that was like the best, really? And so after you smoked half that joint, you can tell me what the half of that other joint did to you. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is I defy somebody but telling me that you can. You, yeah, you, you can tell me that, say it all day long. Oh, yeah, no, I got way higher. No, you didn't. <laughs> I'll tell you, it might have lasted longer. Yeah. The experience of the high lasted longer, but did your actual intensity of that high get higher? Did yeah, it no. really? Honestly, I wouldn't be able to tell you with flour, but mm -hmm. with if you're comparing like flour to concentrate, all of a sudden you feel like you're going to die. Yeah, like, I remember the first time that I did uh, a dab. Yes. I was in my dorm room and I was like, oh my God, this is how I die. I was like, my mom's going to fucking find me here in my dorm room and I'm going to be dead off of this dab. I literally had this entire. Uh, mental, but at the same time, then the third dab you did, right? Did it do the same thing? No, it did not. So, did this, the twentieth dab you did, right? Did the same thing? Right. The tolerance goes up for sure, Correct. but it's you know it's that level of potency again, and it's dosing, and it's under. If I would have understood how potent 
99 percent, 98 percent THC was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had no concept. You right. can't you can't have a concept because you're smoking something that has 12 to 25 percent. And even then, you're only getting about two to three percent of the bioavailability Correct. through a joint. Right. So you're you know, a lot of it's falling off when you do a dab. You're getting, you know, much more than that. And it's concentrated. So it's just, again, going back to the education of uh, letting people know that, hey, for your first time. Why don't we? Why don't yeah, we take do your time. Yeah. You know. Well, you know. I, I tell you, I've, I've been one just uh, that. You know. I'm, I go back 20 years, almost 20 years ago. I started changing over to consuming mostly keef. 20 years ago, Ooh, I stopped doing flour. So, you know, and, and the keef, you know, uh, became one of the the best products to actually use and infuse for yeah. me. So I was making, you know, my I I don't want to call it butter, but my sludge out of keef. <laughs> And keefe either mixed with butter or mixed with, you know, uh, vegetable glycerin or right. something like that. And I, you know, I would simmer, you know, this at, you know, I'm telling you, simmer down at about, you know, less than, you know, 119. Yeah. You know, I try to get it, keep it below, you know, 212. I didn't want to boil it. So yeah, I bring course. it down. So I'm just breaking down the trichomes and breaking them out and letting that mix and mingle. And I would like literally cook some of this from time for two to three days in wow. my apartment on a, on a saucepan, and, you know, a double boiler. So I yeah. put, you know, the water on the bottom, yep, stick the yep. keep and butter in the pan and just let it sit there. And I go check it every now and then, make sure it's not bubbling at all. And it was just simmering. It'd be nice and hot. Let it sit there. And then after the third day, then I would take that. And infuse that into, you know, whatever back then, recipe. I, yeah, whatever recipe I was doing. You know, <laughs> most of the time, I was making poppy seed muffins. Uh, but, uh, but literally, would, would, you know, I, now, again, my tolerance level was pretty high. Excuse me, because I was using mostly, you know, even when I wanted to have a, a fun experience, I was literally, the only way I could have fun is if I mitigated the pain in my feet. Yeah. And so I was really using it more to get rid of my neuropathic pain. Right. So, but, you know, I know started noticing that by, you know, the fourth or fifth time that I consumed, you know, that first buzz was like normally, you know, through the roof. And I'd literally give somebody a half a muffin and they would do a nice sleep, sweet prince, you know, <laughs> for a couple of days. <laughs> but then, you know, the next time they come over and they ask for another muffin, they could hang out for a minute. And then, you know, the next time then we, you know, go out and have some fun. Right, right. But the truth was that, you know, the intensity – of the type of cannabis you use and the 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 I want to say style no the you know how you use whether it be leaf you know or keef or concentrate now do you infuse with all of those at um, all yeah we do but it's really uh, no matter what we infuse with it's really about the profile so mm -hmm. it doesn't matter like it, there's a misconception that, oh, sativa and indica and right. all the stuff. The only difference that makes sativa this and indica this is the cannabinoid profile. Right. So whether we're infusing keef, whether we're infusing distillate, whether we're infusing flour, what, whatever it is, none of it matters until it goes to the next stage where we can actually lab test it and right. get the cannabinoid profile. Right. And that's the only time that we can actually use it. So what we do, though over a 10 course tasting menu is we will in, in our standard offering is 10 milligrams of THC and 10 milligrams of CBD with terpenes and about eight and eight ounces of uh, wine pairing. Okay. And so what this does is the first and foremost, the ethanol acts as a catalyst for the metabolism of mm -hmm. THC. Mm -hmm. So instead of feeling it in an hour, you're going to feel it in about 15 minutes. And what we do is in the first three courses out of the 10 courses, you're going to get five milligrams of THC. Course four, five, six, seven, and eight, you're getting one milligram. So if you- One can, milligram over all four courses? Correct. Okay. Uh, no, one milligram in each course. Each course, course. okay. And so it kind of keeps you up in this, what we call the euphoric zone. So, and then uh, courses nine and 10, you receive five milligrams of CBD each. So to, Bring it back to down equal, a little bit. right. To, so what we do is if you can imagine the X and Y axis, mm -hmm. the Y axis, the a vertical axis being how high you are. And then the X axis, the duration, being the duration. Mm -hmm. So one through 10, right. Um, we want to keep you between a four and a five on the, on the high scale, because that's what we, what we refer to as the euphoric zone. Sure. Meaning that you aren't uh, you aren't overwhelmed. You're engaged in conversation, mm -hmm. and you're engaged in the environment around you in a social aspect. Great. And then uh, what we do is we keep you in there through the one milligram, and then 
over the last two courses, the CBD brings you into blissful relaxation. Mm -hmm. That's where we usher you to the lounge. You can get some, you can get a five minute massage. You can have some pedophores. You can have a, you know, a wonderful mixed drink that has THC or CBD, depending mm -hmm. on your mood. And then we, there's lounge seating and live music. So you can indulge in your senses. And this is the restaurant that you have right now. We do a lot of experiences. Okay, experiences. Uh, so this is, this is different than the restaurant, but the restaurant will have that. The bottom floor is going to be the restaurant upstairs is going to be the lounge and this is like if somebody were to uh, you should give out some of your stats so people know how to get a hold of you let's say they want to book a party what would they do uh they would go to the herbalchef.com okay yeah, everything can be found on the herbalchef.com or we post everything to instagram mostly which is at the under or the herbal chef with underscores between so wow. the underscore herbal underscore chef. so if somebody's coming to california you're coming out to california and maybe coming out for you know a, a a bachelorette party or a bachelor party <laughs> or you're coming out to hang out with some friends to go to a game you know i would put this is part of my you know vacation yeah, why not absolutely. have a night with the herbal chef come on by have you come yeah. by the hotel and and lay us out right? yeah exactly and we do a lot of these events around the world so we're we host our own we get we get flown around to do these private dinners, mm -hmm. you know, all over the world. So it's really, um, it's really brought us some incredible stuff. And we always use local ingredients. We always use uh, sustainable practices. Uh, and oftentimes when we go anywhere else, we'll go to, uh, I'll go fishing, foraging, hunting for mm -hmm. whatever we're using in the dinner. Oh, okay. um, so to, you know, just create this really uh, strong connection between our diners the, who's preparing the food and then uh, the food and where it comes from. Wow. 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 You know, have you ever thought you could probably consider holding some medicinal dinners? Um, yeah. I mean, we, we definitely do. That's like something that we've been, uh, but I mean, like, like pointedly reaching out to patients who want to understand the experience. Yeah, we, we, we very much do. Like, so we do a lot of patient dinners mm -hmm. um, and we do quite a few uh, delivery options for patients. So we work with a food nutritionist and a food scientist, and then we ask the patient to give us, you know, what, what it is that they uh, can eat, can't eat, or what their illness is. And then mm -hmm. we build a meal program that is specific to what they can eat. Wow. And then it's, we can add in CBD or, and or THC in there, uh, depending on if they would like that or not. Wow. But essentially food is thy medicine. So we work with patients, we work with athletes, we work with bodybuilders, we work mm -hmm. with people that uh, want to, uh, you know, just get a meal plan that is actually going to work for them and sure. is specified for them. What if, uh, you know, listening in right now, tuning in right now, there's a couple of people, I'm sure that we got some some chefs from all over the country that are listening in right now going, I would really like to just get a week if I could yeah. with you. You know, <laughs> to, to, you know, maybe get a week to come out and sit down and talk to Chris about, you know, how I could make my experiences better in my hometown. How would they do that? Well, you know, we please reach out first and foremost, but oftentimes um, my schedule is crazy. And so what we've done is created, you know, the curriculum. But I think that what we do even more so is we have the L.A. Chef Conference coming up where I'll be um, doing moderating the panel there on cannabis and mm -hmm. and then I'll be doing a huge presentation uh, at the National Restaurant Association in May and so there's these huge opportunities to come and actually work with us and then also get the education but we're also you know send us an email with your resume and we have stage opportunities all the time um, although we do get inundated with quite a few of these people reaching out wanting to uh, get a piece of this and wanting to wanting to help in, in whatever sure. way. So it's, you know, there's there's quite a backup. That's why we do like these bigger events where we can have more and more people come in. What's the biggest challenge right now facing this as an industry in the sense of the biggest challenge that you're facing? You know, again, we've got 34 states in the District of Columbia. California is open because they've been ahead of the game for a while. But, you know, uh, yeah, I would guarantee you that in Florida right now, there's municipalities that are fearful. Absolutely. Of opportunities like this. So what's the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is education. Mm -hmm. It's educating on why cannabis is even here, and mm -hmm. especially with the older generation, mm -hmm. um, and then what this is going to turn into, and the level of sophistication that cannabis can have. And I think that with the chef side specifically, the culinary side, is because people see it being done, uh, they think that they are they can just do the same thing. But Ultimately, it comes again back to that science of dosing. Absolutely, um, and I think that the <laughs> municipalities. 
have this wild idea of if everyone's smoking weed, then all of a sudden it's going to go crazy and there's going to be all this stuff that happens. And it's like so misguided in terms of the legislation that they're putting up because they think that on-site consumption is going to, you know, somehow ruin everything. Right. Or like, so you yet, the, yet they will let you go to on-site consumption at any bar, any restaurant, right, any right. hotel, lobby. Yes. Go ahead. Right. Right. It's just, it's just misguided. It's when it comes to alcohol. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's just so uh, unfortunate that it is still viewed that way and that they haven't taken the time to understand the community, really. I'm going to tell you, look, I'm almost out of time. I'm going to tell you that I'm positive that this is going to be probably one of the most listened to of my podcasts that I've done today. <laughs> and so, you know, you got to come back, Chris. Is that Absolutely. all right? Absolutely. Of course. And, and, I, and I look forward to staying in touch. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something, you know, but off off uh, tape, you know, before we started, I said to you, like, you know, I'm really, 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 I personally am really interested in this as an initiative. And so if there's something that I can do personally to help you guys and help move this forward, I would be more than happy to figure out how we can work together. And I'm, I'm going to look for opportunities to work with you. Yeah, I would to love To help that. get the word out. Okay? I for appreciate sure. it, Montel. So look, you know, look, guys, you've been listening to Let's Be Blunt with Montel. And um, this was probably one of my best experiences. And don't forget, look it up. It's the herbalchef.com. Going up online and get yourself some information. And join me on the next Let's Be Blunt with Montel.